So you heard what Brian said. You know what they've done. They've taken Gray out of the rotation. Was that the right move? Definitely the right move. I mean, I think the writing's been on the wall. It, he got a stay of execution here, Sonny did, because he had a couple good starts in a row. And I think everybody in Yankees universe was hoping for the best, hoping this was going to be a turnaround for Sonny Gray's season. And after what happened yesterday, it's just um, obviously not going to happen. Can you, Tex, can you give me a little bit of insight as, as to why you think uh, Cash was so so open about, you could tell, not believing there's a future for Sonny Gray here. It just seemed so forward to me. Well, I think Brian Cashman has um, earned a lot of respect in uh, that clubhouse and around baseball for being honest, for being open, for being a guy who, whether you like what he says or not, is going to shoot you straight. And if he went out there and said, oh, we believe in Sonny Gray, he still has a future, um, we're going to work with him, and he'll be back in the rotation within a few weeks, he'd be lying to you. He, he, you know, at, at best, he would be misleading you because the fact of the matter is no one in the Yankees um, you know, clubhouse or, or in the front office has confidence that Sonny Gray can go out there and turn his season around. Would they like him to? Of course. They, they're not going to completely give up on him. They're not going to release the guy. And Cashman said, I'm not going to sell low on the guy, but you know, we don't trust him to, to be in the starting rotation right now. Is there a way, most likely for a player or management, to look at a guy, Mark, and say, he's not succeeding because of, and then say, because he can't play in New York City? Is there a way, and do you think that that's the deal with Gray? Because his stuff is good enough to be very effective in the majors. Yes, sir, yes. I, I think certain players um, just don't like playing here, don't flourish here. Sonny Gray would never say that. Uh, he, I mean, he's, he's a good guy. He's a nice guy. He, he's a good teammate. Um, well respected in the clubhouse from a, from a personal standpoint, but I'm not sure if he's built for New York. He might be too nice. He might be a guy where um, you know the, the the crowd booing him gets on him. Yeah, you, know, you saw him smile off the off the uh, the mound the other day. That's kind of his way of, of doing what Jack McDowell did. Uh, you know, heck, 20 years ago now, however long ago that was to Yankee fans. Um, Jack McDowell didn't last very long in New York. Uh, <laughs> It's tough. I don't want to beat a man when he's down, but I just don't think Sonny Gray in New York is a good fit. Now, Sonny Gray, speaking to the media, Meredith Morakovic just tweeted this out. I don't think my days as a starting pitcher in this league are over, but right now it's all about winning and doing my part, and my role right now is in the bullpen. And I, I look at it, Mark, and I say, Lance Lynn stuff to me translated out of the bullpen. I'm not sure Sonny does, so... If you're going to keep Sonny Gray in the bullpen and you can't send him down because he's been a big leaguer for five years, I think you're playing with a 24-man roster. What's your deal? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Michael. I mean, if he's going to be just a guy who, who you're only going to use as a mop-up role, because um, that's really what he is right now. I mean, are you going to put him into a, a one-run game in, in Fenway this weekend? No. No, N no chance. So it's going to be a, a five-plus run game, you know, on one side or the other for the Yankees. Um, and, you know, for, for the type of money you're paying him and for the, the type of backlash that he's going to get every time he steps on the mound at Yankee Stadium, uh, I just don't see any way he turns this around. And it's, it's unfortunate, but the fact of the matter is you win some, you lose some. Cash has done an amazing job of, of compiling this roster, adding talent to the system. He's made some great trades. He's made some great signings. This one hasn't worked out. I just don't, don't know if there's a chance for it to work out. Well, you watched yesterday's game, I'm sure, uh, and right before the tarp was put on, Phil Nevin came into the dugout and just lit them up. Now, we didn't show the front portion of that on Yes because he was clearly cursing. Does that stuff help? Is, is it what David Cohn says, eyewash? Does it get players' attention? No, I love it. Personally, I love it. Um, and I love a guy like Phil Nevin doing it because this isn't Aaron Boone doing it. Aaron Boone doing it um, would, would be a little bit out of character, would, would maybe put some guys off, would... Um, you know, just they just wouldn't look right. Phil Nevin is a baseball guy. I played with Nev in Texas in 2005, 2006. 
He is an old-school baseball guy. And old-school baseball guys look at what happened on the field yesterday, and they hate it. And you know what? There's a lot of, of, of great guys in that clubhouse and nice guys in that clubhouse. There's not a lot of old-school baseball guys that are going to rip into the team. And, and Nev served a role yesterday. Uh, maybe if I was still in that dugout, I would, have, I would have done the same thing. Who knows? But, you know, you cannot accept that type of play when you're five and a half games out and you're losing to the worst team in baseball. It's unacceptable, and Nev let the guys know that. Does it concern you the way Gleyber Torres played on defense yesterday? No, it does not. And this is why would he do that, though? I, I we we are human. He said it in his post game interview. He's human. He made a mistake. He, um, you know, listen. Day game after night game. Sometimes these these things happen. He's worried about, um, you know, you know his health. He's worried about getting hits. Sometimes you have brain farts out there. And it doesn't look good. Now, unfortunately, he had two. Right. But I haven't, I haven't seen Glaber Torres um, be a habitual, um, you know, lazy guy or habitual uh, guy that doesn't cover the base at the right time. I just think this was a unfortunate day for him. Um, and let's also remember, he's been a second baseman for less than a year. This guy is a shortstop. Every now and then, yeah, he didn't run. As, as hard as he could, but this is not this is not something that uh, we've seen all year long, and it's becoming a problem. It's just it happens, and I think Glaber is going to learn from it. He's a great player; he'll continue to learn from these type of experiences. And um, sometimes you have to take your knocks. Um, if this series goes badly for the Yankees, uh, let three they lose three or four or get swept. How much do you mentally move on from winning the division and start thinking about playing a one-game playoff? Well, fans mentally move on. The, the team never will. The okay. team will not mentally move on until they are mathematically eliminated. And that's just, you might think I'm just, you know, giving you a load, Peter, but that's the fact of the matter. Every player in that clubhouse is trying to win the division until someone tells them, hey, guys, by the way, you're mathematically eliminated. Let's go get them in the wild card. But fans, I mean, if you're seven and a half games out after this weekend in Boston, you got to kind of look at yourself and say, we have to really play some great baseball um, to, to catch these guys because it does not look like the Red Sox are slowing up. Uh, we've got some text messages for you, Mark. Keith from Brick, New Jersey. Mark, you were tremendous on Get Up. <laughs> Who from the Red Sox rivalry were you closest to and how did that come about? Well, first of all, thank you, Keith, for uh, um, for saying that about Get Up. I really enjoyed that. It's a lot of fun. Um, who I was closest with on the Red Sox rivalry? Uh, I, I can't really say I was close to anybody I played against with the Red Sox. I mean, I was with with the Yankees for eight years. I didn't play with any Reds, you know, ex Red Sox. I probably say the guy I respect the most is Justin Pedroia because I played against him for, for his entire career, you know, up until when I retired and just loved the way he plays the game. And even though I didn't like seeing him hit doubles off the monster against us, um, you know, we talk at first base and just respect the way that he, uh, he goes about his business. One thing I'm going to warn you, Mark, not that you're asking for my advice. <laughs> if you continue to excel on Get Up, you'll be getting up at 3 in the morning for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know what? I'd, I'd have a 4.30 wake-up call. I'm in a car at 5 o'clock to be uh, in, in New York City at Pier 17 by 6 o'clock. It's, uh, it's, it's wearing me out a little bit, Michael. I'm not going to lie. What to time you. do you usually get up on a normal day when you're not doing Get Up? It's uh, 6.30 to 7 is, is a normal wake-up really? for me. Um, yeah, 6.30 to 7. You know, I got you know, kids in school. So, so I, I wake up around 6.30 every day, maybe sleep in every now and then during the summertime and on weekends. But, yeah, it's cutting, cutting two hours out of my sleep. <laughs> Pete from Long Island asks, it appears the number of switch hitters have been reducing over the years. Why do you think this is, and do you think it will ever increase? Yeah, there's, there's two main reasons. I get this question a lot. Two main reasons. One, it's just not as big of an advantage to be a switch hitter. Pitchers are better. They've got cutters and change-ups that can neutralize a switch hitter. Also, the shifts are neutralizing the switch switch hitters. You know, if I'm a great right-handed hitter, why would I ever want to hit left-handed when you know I know the statistics show that left-handers hit 20, uh, 20 points lower than righties? Um, I think those two things ha have really made 
you know, switch hitters um, you know, become obsolete. Now, one thing I will say is youth baseball has also you know, made an impact in switch hitting in that when I was 10, 11, 12, I tried to switch hit. I was working on switch hitting, and my coaches didn't like it because I wasn't as good of a player because I was learning how to hit left-handed. By the time I was 13, I just said, forget it. If you want me on your team, I'm hitting left-handed. But I guarantee you there's a ton of young players where their coaches are saying, I'm not letting you stink for a couple years or at least the season on my team so you can learn how to switch hit. You're going to hit right-handed, and you're going to stay that way. That's an interesting take on that. And it seems, and I'm sorry, with the shifts, Mark, Left-handed hitters, they're the losers in this. I mean, that's why Cashman's always been ahead of the curve. That's why this team is heavily tilted to the right side. Lefty hitters lose 50 points off their average with shifts. If 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 I ever had a, a, a child, you know, my, my 12-year-old and 7-year-old, they, they dabble in baseball. If one of them all of a sudden became a stud, I would not let them hit left-handed. They're right-handed hitters. I would just tell them, you guys are not allowed to hit left-handed because it's not an advantage. You have to work on two swings. You're a right-handed hitter. Don't switch it like your dad. <laughs> it's not It's not all it's cracked up to be. Um, the Mets blow out the other day. There, there seemed to be some smiles, and I, I didn't have as big a problem with it because when you have games like that, I just think, well, what are you going to do? Your take on that. Well, the season's been over for months. First of all, so, so let's remember that. It's not like they were on the cusp and decided to sell a few pieces of the deadline and everyone in there is, is just in shock that they didn't go all in at the trade deadline. The Mets have been bad for a long time. Um, I don't have a problem with guys blowing off some steam, laughing a little bit, because um, you play every day, sometimes you have to laugh. Sometimes, even when you're getting your butt kicked, the game was over for, for a long time. Um, it doesn't bother me. Now, if they lose 25 to 4 three times a week and the guys are still laughing, then, yeah, I, I think I would have an issue with that. I but what about, what about the fact, for me, Tex, what I found problematic, and I know we don't understand the mentality of the players involved in the game necessarily, but for me what was difficult about it was not only were they laughing, but they were getting laughed at by their divisional rivals. I mean, Zimmerman was laughing in their face the entire game practically. It just seemed like a team who at this point has, has no pride in the jersey they're wearing, at least at this at this moment. Yeah, I can't disagree with you there, Peter. I really can't. Um, and there are, there are some good players on that roster. Um, they just, there's not enough of them. <laughs> you know, you can still build around Syndergaard and DeGrom. And I think those guys continue to battle. Those guys know that I have a chance to, um, you know, to be on a winning team again. Half the players on that roster, Peter, aren't going to be there next year. That, that's just the fact of the matter. And so you have half the guys in there that, are, that have kind of phoned in the rest of the season. And um, this is, these are the type of things you get. You get laughed at by the division rivals. Our final thing before we let you go, um, this is the epicenter of the baseball world tonight, Fenway Park. So I could tell people what it's like to announce games here. Fans could talk about what it's like to sit in the stands. You have stood on that field in front of sellout crowds. What's it like, and is it different than other games? It absolutely is different than other games. It's electric, especially close games late when you, you can't even hear yourself think. Um... You never think the game is over in Boston because they always seem to come back at the end. They always seem to put up some runs at the end. And um, I just think every Major League Baseball player should get to play the Yankees-Red Sox game one time. <laughs> Experience Yankee Stadium on a, you know, on a Saturday afternoon or, or Fenway on a Saturday afternoon when everyone's happy and, and it's, it's beautiful weather outside. Two good teams are going after you. Maybe your aces are on the mound. That's like baseball heaven. And uh, you know, you're going to get two great teams. Yeah, there's a few guys that are you know, out of the lineup and, and not pitching this weekend. But you have two great teams facing each other this weekend, and I can't wait to watch. You doing get up tomorrow? I am. All right, get I to am. bed. They, they got me all week. Get to bed, Mark. Thanks.